Well, hello, everybody. Uh, I commend any of you who had the patience to hang on for 20 minutes while Zoom made us run in circles. I, I should have updated over the summer, but I haven't done a Zoom talk since we did this last May. And apparently, Zoom had gotten out of date. I'm glad to be back with you. And those of you who are new to this, welcome. I sure wish I could see you guys. I mean, for, for two reasons. One, because you're friends of Grove City College. And if you're friends of Grove City College, you're friends of me. And I'd like to see my friends. And the other thing is, I still haven't gotten used to lecturing to a computer screen. Uh, the advantage of being in the classroom, of course, is if the students, uh, if you sort of see the eyes glaze over, you go, ah, need to change my tactic or approach here a little bit, and you can make an adjustment. I'm flying blind here, so I'll just do the best I can. Our topic tonight has to deal with this issue of equality and inequality and how that relates to the field of economics. And I'll just start with a quote that you all know and that's very dear to our hearts as Americans. Quote, all men are created equal, close quote. I know I learned that in elementary school. I imagine most of you did too. But what does that phrase mean? In what sense are all humans created equal? In a legal sense, we're, we're equal before the law. Morally and legally, we're the same. In a godly sense, you know, spiritually, metaphysically, we're all equal in the eyes of God. And that should be carried out or reflected in our systems of justice, as we read in Leviticus 19.15. There's not one set of laws for the rich and the powerful and the privileged and another set of laws for the, you know, the lowly common working man or anything like that. We're all equal in the eyes of God. But we're not all equal economically. We're not all equally talented. For whatever reasons, the creator did not make us equal in the sense of making us the same. There are vast individual differences between us. And this is this creates an economic reality that we all have to confront and, and, and deal with. And this is explained in the Bible in Matthew chapter 25 with the parable of the talents. It's very clear some people are more talented than others. Um, there must be millions of men in this country that wish they could play quarterback the way Patrick Mahomes plays it. There must be millions of young women in this country that wish they could sing and perform like Taylor Swift. And then there are the people with the entrepreneurial gifts. I don't know if you know the story of a fairly young woman named Sarah Blakely. She came up with kind of a simple idea. She you know, she wanted to look good when she was dressed up. And so she developed a new set of women's underwear that doesn't show any lines for, you know, through a skirt or something like that. That sounds like a very simple idea, but it made her a billionaire. But again, not everybody comes up with these inspirations and then not everybody has the, the initiative and the drive to follow through on these things and, and create a multi-billion dollar business. We're just endowed with different gifts and that, that, that's the way the creator wants it. And I, 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 for one, am not gonna argue with that. There used to be a dogma an economic theory, you know, that, well, people should trade equals. Well, that can't really happen. Let me review something from last year. The simple concept and the central concept of value in the study of economics. You know, value is not an objective measurement. It's not a quantity that's fixed. Adam Smith thought it was. David Ricardo thought it was. These were the two great classical economists. And Karl Marx picked up on that error and turned it into a very vicious dogma, the labor theory of value. That was exploded in 1871 by the Austrian thinker, Austrian economist, Karl Menger, who realized that value is subjective. It changes between people. It changes within the same person from time to time, depending on their circumstances. And really, when you think about it, it doesn't make sense to say that people trade objective values because after all, if one product is worth $10, $10, and the other is worth $8. The person who's 
got the 10 isn't going to trade down for the eight. You know, maybe the person at the eight would like to trade up to the 10, but the person from 10, he's not going to just trade down. Well, the, the good news is that the, the value is subjective. It's not a fixed quantity. And at one moment in time, one person values what the other person has more than what he's willing to give up and vice versa. Later on, the shoe might be on the other foot and it go the other way. I think I told you last year, those of you who were, were part of this lecture series last year, about the great economist Thomas Sowell. Thomas Sowell was never trained in Austrian economics, but the guy's brilliant. And he figured out for himself that we don't trade equals. If, if, if there were equals, it, it would be a log jam. I mean, nobody who has 10 is going to trade down for eight. And they're not going to trade for 10. I mean, why do that? That's just treading water. So the only way to have trade is for both sides to benefit. And both sides benefit because they value things differently. Um, give you an example. When I was a, in high school, there were three left-handers on our, our street. Uh, I, I'm a lefty, and, you know, when you're in a minority like that, you kind of notice those things. And a very close friend of mine, he's still a close friend, Rick was left-handed, but he played the violin right-handed. He was five houses down to my right. Four houses down to my left was a kid named Glenn. He played the piano. Now, as a lefty, I don't think it really matters with the piano. But then later he picked up the guitar. Well, they both went into musical careers. You know, I, I, I was the lucky guy. I didn't have to take music lessons. I regret that now. I think I missed out on something. But anyhow, Rick went on and had a wonderful multi-decade career playing violin for one of the great symphony orchestras in Canada. And he did quite well for himself financially. Glenn went out to California and put together a band. He you know, played for a couple bands, then he put together his own, own band. You might have heard of them. They're called the Eagles. They made a lot of money. And both were working hard as, as young people, mastering their musicians. But Glenn earned multiple times the income that Rick earned. Now, that's not equal. But is it unfair? See, there are these ideologues called egalitarians that think we need to be economically equal. Well, Glenn and Rick ended up being very economically unequal. And why? Was it because they did anything wrong or unethical? Of course not. It was simply the way the market worked out. We have the free market system, the private property order, capitalism, or what Ludwig von Mises referred to as the system where the consumer was sovereign. And so a bunch of individuals, millions of individuals made the choice that they valued the music of the Eagles higher than they valued classical music. And so it was the decision of these individuals freely made. Nobody coerced or compelled them. They just freely chose the, what they liked more over what they didn't like quite as much. And we end up with this great economic inequality. Now, the egalitarians trying to make an economic scandal out of that. But it's just the result of free people. No, nobody was defrauded. Nobody was cheated. Nobody was coerced. Very, very natural. And that's how we should look at our, our economic lives. We are different. We are unequal. There's a story I used to share in the first week of my Econ 101 course at Grove City College. It was called Letter to His Grandson. I think it was written in 1942. Uh, the Foundation for Economic Education published it for a while. I think the original copyright was owned by the, the Free Market Foundation. But this man explained to his grandson about economic differences. And he said, picture a primitive village, 100 people there. And each one of them needed to get a quota of water each day for their personal needs. And the only place, they lived in a place where you had to go halfway up a mountainside where there was some sort of lake or grotto or something where they could fill their buckets and go back down. And it took an hour each day. Well, this one clever entrepreneurial guy kind of invented a new system. He figured out how to build a trench and a basin down by his house so he could just open the gates and the water flow down. 
He didn't have to go up the mountain anymore. So he cut a deal with his fellow tribes people. He said to the other 99, look, give me 10 minutes worth of your labor each day and you can come here for your water. Well, guess what? Taking 10 minutes, you know, 10 minutes cost of their labor and then a few more minutes to go get the water instead of a whole hour trekking up and down the mountainside, that was a nice savings. So maybe they all saved, what, 45 minutes a day. They were better off. They could put that time to other productive uses, earn them just for leisure, enjoyment, whatever they wanted. They were richer by 45 minutes a day. But because they agreed in exchange to give the inventor of this, this technique for bringing the water down to them, he profited a lot more. I mean, 99 tribesmen, 10 minutes worth a day, that's 990 minutes of labor you know, that, he, that is accruing to his benefit. Well, let's ask the fundamental political question. As the Romans used to say, cui bono, which means who benefits? Well, everybody. The 99 tribesmen saved, you know, 45 minutes a day. And by giving them this service, the one inventing got, inventive fellow, he profits by about 990 minutes of labor. So he, he, now, obviously there's a difference there. This isn't equal. The one profits by an immense amount. The other 99 profit by a modest amount. You can look at it two ways. You can be happy that all of them are better off, all of them profit. Or you can look at it like an egalitarian, those grumpy egalitarians. I, I think sometimes they're misanthropes. So that's not fair. The one guy's benefiting more than the other. Yeah, but that's because he did more for other people. Well, what would have happened? You know, maybe this uh, inventive guy can come up with other labor saving devices. But let's say the majority decides to get rough with them and say, hey, there's 99 of us, there's only one of you. We're just going to take the water and we're not going to compensate you. Well, maybe a short-term victory for them, but you can bet your bottom dollar that that creative, inventive individual is not going to find any other labor-saving devices that he's going to share with them. The incentives have been removed. Better to let the natural profit system come to light there. Just remember the economics of profit. You know, one, one fresh way of looking at profit that they don't teach in a lot of economic textbooks is that profit is just new wealth. It's wealth that didn't exist there before. But another way of looking at profits is, is just to realize that it's a rough approximation of the value that's been created for others. Remember, the profit is the result of economic exchanges. The consumer purchases the product. So it's at a price where the seller of the product, the vendor, is making a profit. But the consumer is profiting. He would rather have the product that he's buying than the money he's paying for. Because if he valued the money more than the product, he'd keep his money. But remember, we don't trade equals, we trade up. We trade that which we value less for that which we value more. And so you know, some people just, I cringe every time I hear some poor college kids say, oh, I'm going to go work for a not-for-profit, you know, as if there's something morally tainted about profits. No, that's not an enlightened, reasonable way to look at profits. They're the evidence of doing good, for others, of delivering value to one's fellow man. I hardly think that's antisocial. But that's where the egalitarians come in and mess things up with their destructive ideology. I mean, it's it's really kind of sad and pathetic in a way because they're, they're at war, not with just economics, but with just reality. The fact that, you know, nature, creation, we're, 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 we're different. Um, you know, the, the, the wealth creators create prosperity for us. Why do we then malign them and attack them and want to tax the heck out of them, take, take their wealth away from them as if they're some sort of criminal or something like that? It just doesn't make sense. And that's the problem with an ideology, any ideology, but the egalitarian ideology is really insidious. It's really anti-economic, and that makes it anti-human.
there was a French economist almost a decade ago who made a huge splash. He wrote a book, uh, I think it was called Capitalism in the 21st Century. Thomas Piketty was the economist name. Kind of a neo-Marxist, uh, not, not a complete Marxist, but definitely no friend of free markets and private property and very much an egalitarian. And because he was an egalitarian, he thought that society needed to have measurements where people were more equal economically, that it's bad when there are noticeable differences where some people are a lot richer than others. And so he favored, right in his book, he basically praised the 1930s and badmouth the 1980s here in America. Now, if you know your economic history, some of you I'm sure are old enough to remember the 80s. After the stagnant 70s, the 80s were a boom time. The Reagan boom got started there. And it was a time of growing prosperity. And yes, some entrepreneurs became really, really rich. But overall, standards of living were rising for people. Minorities had a wonderful decade, you know, a huge increase in minority families making over $50,000 a year, a huge increase in minority families sending their kids to college. It just, it, it was boom time. What was the 30s? That was the Great Depression. Yeah, the measures of equality were showing where people were more equal. The problem is they were more equal by getting poorer. So what would you rather have? You know, equality? with poverty or inequality with growing prosperity. And if you care about your fellow man, I urge you to go for prosperity, not for the poverty. That's, you, you, you can see how dark and wicked this egalitarian thought is. Now, a lot of egalitarians are, are communists and socialists, but that doesn't mean that all communists and socialists are rigid egalitarians. Thank goodness for a whole lot of people that they aren't. And, and the outstanding example that I can think of is the Chinese leader, Deng Xiaoping. Now, under Mao, China practiced a pretty orthodox communism, and Mao, Mao essentially ground his people into poverty. When Mao died in 1976, the per capita income of China was $163 a year. But then Deng came along and took over. And he made this amazing statement. We should let some people get rich first. We should let some people get rich first. And that's the only way social prosperity happens. There's never been a way where you could just flip a switch and everybody prospers equally at the same instant. It doesn't work that way. But Dung realized that if progress takes steps, so be it. Let's get, let's get rich. The only way that you can have a society get rich in this world, which is some people prosper today and more prosper tomorrow, more prosper the next day. Get that trend going in the right direction. And it's really paid off for the Chinese because today their per capita income is almost $13,000, a massive increase. Now, let me just explain something here. Yes, I know that China is ruled by the Chinese Communist Party. And right now their communist leader is playing hardball. I mean, he's, he's a very heavy handed ruler. But for most of the decades since Mao's passing, there's kind of been this truce between the central government and the outlying provinces of China. Basically, as long as the local leaders, the regional leaders, as long as they remain politically loyal to the Communist Party, it was kind of a wild, wild west economically. It's like, hey, guys, go out and find ways to make money. It's okay. So it's China's a very weird system. I mean, there's a lot of just wild, wild west capitalism, relatively free markets. A lot of corruption, a lot of cronyism, but a lot of freedom too. But I wouldn't want to be there today. And they're heading toward deep trouble in the coming decade because of a pending demographic collapse. I mean, the one-child policy is really going to do a number on the Chinese. 
But notice by rejecting strict egalitarianism, the country boomed. And, and other countries boomed a lot since 1970. Uh, one of my favorite examples in South America, Chile, 1976, they had a per capita income of $957. Last year, it was up to 15356 And most of that time, they had a semi-free market. I mean, they, they had a big welfare state, but they, they had a lot of dynamic capitalism. Probably the champion of the last half century in terms of economic growth is Singapore. Very radical free market, minimal government kind of place. In 1976, the per capita income in Singapore was about $2,700. Today, it's almost $83,000. So, uh, because why? Because they made their peace with capitalism, free markets, private property, and economic inequality. They accepted that as a fact of life. They made their peace with it. They said, look, we're not going to punish people for getting ahead. And so people said, great, we're going to get ahead. And a lot of them did. Some didn't. There's no perfect solution where everybody in a society is going to, to prosper. Egalitarianism is one of the ideological underpinnings of socialism and we see a lot of our politicians talking in egalitarian terms these days. And they often try to disguise it as, they call it social justice, you know, is using that as a euphemism for real socialism. That is such a grotesque phrase, social justice. It's a solecism in language. Solecism is a fancy word that means that the term doesn't quite make sense. And why? Because it's redundant. You don't need to say social justice. Ju justice is how we treat each other in society. Justice is inherently a social thing. But they want to replace traditional justice with what they call social justice. In other words, socialist justice, greater equality of wealth. And yet, let's ask some questions. The people that they go at, the people that they despise and they want to raise the taxes against, you know, there are entrepreneurs like Steve Jobs, who, you know, the Apple computer dude, Sarah Blakely, the Spanx underwear lady I told you about a short time ago. Did those entrepreneurs rip off the poor? No, they just came up with a product that somehow enhanced or enriched people's lives. Then why loot them as if they're some sort of, you know, sociopathic criminals or something? They're not, they're, 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 they're benefactors. And, and what the social justice people can never quite explain is, you know, we know it's a crime for anybody to steal their fellow citizen's property. You know, you're, you're not allowed to take somebody else's property. That's a crime. And yet, if the government does it for you, all of a sudden it becomes social justice. I don't know about you, but that sounds kind of like a crock to me. Today, we have the auto workers, you know, there's, we want fair pay, we want fair pay. It's interesting that the UAW workers who are on strike, and I don't, I'm, I'm gonna get into what a fair price would be in a moment. And I understand why they wanna raise, because even though their pay's gone up modestly the last few years, it hasn't kept up with inflation. And it's interesting, historically, when we see inflation surge, we see workers strikes, surge because nobody likes to fall behind you know I don't, I don't blame the auto workers for being unhappy now, when they say they want fair pay uh, fair pay what do they mean by that they're, they're already making 30 percent more than tesla workers so if they get a raise they're going to be making even more above what tesla workers earn is that fair it's certainly not egalitarian but the egalitarians only talk about equality when it suits their purposes but what is a fair price? This is a philosophical question that St. Thomas Aquinas wrestled with back in the 1200s. Other economic thinkers have also wrestled with it. I think the Bible gives us an answer. If you have a chance, there's a really neat story in 1 Chronicles chapter 21. King David did a boo-boo. The Lord had commanded him not to number the people but he did. And so a plague started wiping out large numbers of his people. 
And David went, oh boy, did I mess up. I need to make an atonement. I need to make a sacrifice to the Lord and stop this plague that's consuming my people. Well, he happens to be near the threshing floor of a Jebusite by the name of Ornan, or I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. This isn't a, a, a story I ever hear talked about by anybody. I've just read it. Well, Ornan, he wants to go on living. This is my king. Here, I give you the oxen. I give you the wheat. I give you the instruments. I give you the altar. I give you my threshing. I give it to you for free. Stop the plague so I can live. Well, free is a nice price. I mean, I don't know about you. I really like free. But David had integrity here. Why should Ornan bear the cost of David's sin? So David said, hey, I'm going to pay you, quote, the full price. Now, I think David was illustrating justice here. You know, he wasn't going to take a discount much less accepted as a free gift. He was going to pay the full price. Well, what's the full price? That's the only fair price. And although it doesn't use that terminology, it's pretty clear from the tenor of the narration, the, the full price is the market price, the going rate. Whatever supply and demand was at that particular time, that was the market price. That's the fair price. So for the auto workers to get a fair wage, you need to have a free market. Unfortunately, the labor laws in this country don't allow for a free market. I mean, the, you know, in a free market, some workers would say, you're not paying me enough, I'm out of here. And the company would be free to hire replacement workers. But under our labor laws, they can't hire replacement workers. So they've got to somehow mollify the, 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 the workers who are on strike. The only way to find out what a fair wage is, what a market wage is, is to let supply and demand work. It might be what they're making now. It, it might be that a whole lot of Americans would happily accept a couple dollars an hour less. Maybe it would be a couple dollars more. I don't know. No economist does. You just have to let the market work. But we don't have a free market in the auto wage issue that's going on right now. Okay. I want to talk a little, I might have done this last year, but with this whole idea of justice and equality, it helps to review three cardinal social virtues that were set forth by the great moral philosopher Adam Smith. 17 years before he published The Wealth of Nations, one of the great economics books of all time, he published a book in 1759 called The Theory of Moral Sentiments. And there were three cardinal virtues. And the first virtue was simply prudence, which meant take care of yourself so that you're not a burden on your fellow man. The second cardinal virtue was justice. And Justice Smith said, was the fundamental, it was the essential building block for a stable society. Justice meant an absence of injustice. It meant that people's rights were not being violated. What rights? Life, liberty, property. And property is also a biblical, biblically mandated human right. Otherwise, there wouldn't be commandments against stealing and coveting. Because what's mine is mine, and what's yours is yours. Or Isaiah 65, 22, you know, where they said, no, no, the Lord said, we're not going to have a situation where one person plants and another eats. No, everybody gets the fruit of their own labor. Private property is, is intact. And Smith's third cardinal virtue was charity or, or benevolence or beneficence, he went between beneficence and benevolence, doing good for others. But with a very important qualification, it had to be voluntary. Couldn't be compulsory. You couldn't have a majority gang up on a minority and say, hey, 
we think the guy over there needs some money. We're taking some of your money to go help that guy out and do some good works with your money. That was illegitimate to Smith and to the Bible because it violates the prior social virtue of justice. It's violating some citizens' rights instead of impartially upholding the rights of all citizens to their life, liberty, and property. And, you know, let's talk about rights and responsibilities for a minute. I wrote an article for Institute for Faith and Freedom, oh, it was, I think it was in 2010, about our Bill of Rights. And it is a Bill of Rights, not a Bill of Responsibilities. And it does, in the Fifth Amendment, enumerate our right to life, liberty, and property. But you have some people saying, well, you know, you're too rights-oriented. Got to think about our responsibility to our fellow man. Well, Smith said what the first responsibility is. And this is these responsibilities are implicit in our constitutional order. The very first responsibility is don't be a burden on somebody else. Don't take from somebody else. You know, take, take care of yourself so you're not a burden on others. You've got a responsibility to take care of yourself. Now, if, if you just simply can't, then in a Christian society, your Christian fellows will, will, will help you out. Not through government, but directly. If you won't do it because you're lazy, well, then you might be out of luck. You know, um, the responsibility is to go out and get a job. And... How do you find a job? By finding something to do that is of value to your fellow man. It's very promotive, this whole economic imperative that makes us interdependent on each other. This is how you build social ties. We're all in this together. You do this for me, I do that for you. We have a division of labor where we each specialize in something that we can do that is valued by some of our fellow citizens. Therefore, they're willing to pay us for that. So those are our responsibilities. If somebody shirks that responsibility, says, nah, I'm going to just sit back and let others take care of me. Do we have a responsibility to support somebody who shirks their own responsibilities? Seems like we got a double standard there. Or if I have a right to my property and all of a sudden they say, well, this guy's out of work. You know, we're going to tax you to, to give him a stipend each week or each month. Uh, you mean he's got more of a right to my money than I do. Some rights are trump other rights or are more valued or, or ranked higher above other rights. And no, the, you can't do that with rights. Um, FDR was the one who first started demagoguing rights in our country. So, oh, people have a right to a good job. They have a right to a nice home and so on and so forth. Those are wonderful aspirations but the only way they can be considered somebody's right, guaranteeing that they have it, is to guarantee that you're going to force somebody else to provide it. In other words, you violate somebody else's rights in order to give something in the name of this manufactured right. You, you abrogate natural rights to feed these counterfeit rights. They're not really rights. They're, they're, they're legal privileges. Huge, huge difference. Okay. Let me kind of wrap up here. You know, I know we started late, but I, I, I was going to try to plan to go to 8 o'clock. Maybe I'll go a little bit past and allow some time for questions. And, I, and again, I am so sorry we had the technical difficulties with Zoom. I know how precious your time is and I really feel badly that uh, it just wasn't working for quite a while there. So sorry. I want to talk about the impact of egalitarian, this, this fixation with equality, this mistaken belief that economic equality is the norm and is just and is right. I'm going to talk about the impact of uh, egalitarian ideology in four key areas, um, societal, ethical, economic, and political. Societally or socially, if you accept this doctrine of egalitarianism, that we have to make everybody equal, that means you've got to take from some to give to others. 
And that means your fellow citizen becomes a threat to you. This is not good for social harmony. You know, social concord develops from mutual, peaceful, voluntary economic interactions. Class warfare, which a lot of the communists are really into, class warfare means this group is the enemy of this other group in our society. We don't need that kind of poison in our society. We can live in peace and harmony and prosperity with each other. But these egalitarians, they just want to fan the flames of, of envy. And they just keep wanting to create these conditions for class warfare. That's toxic stuff, folks. Ethically, what does egalitarianism do? Well, doesn't it seem kind of perverse that egalitarianism, this redistribution of wealth from the prosperous to the not so prosperous, that the special targets, the people that we want to economically cannibalize, our society's economic benefactors, the really rich people, because how do people get rich in a market economy? Through profits. And how do they make big profits? By serving the needs, by providing something of value to their fellow man in large numbers. Those are not so societal pariahs, they're societal heroes. They are our economic benefactors. The wealth producers of society perform heroic tasks, beneficial tasks that we all benefit from. So it, it does not make sense to attack them, nor does it make sense to reward or subsidize idleness. So much of our welfare state, you know, Lyndon Johnson said, well, we're, you know, we're just gonna help give people a helping hand and get them on their own feet that we won't need a welfare state. Well, here we are 50 years later over $30 trillion of expenditure later, and we still have a, a poverty rate. In fact, what we have is we have a significant percentage of our population totally dependent on federal money to, to, now it gets a lot of them above the poverty line, but they're not working out in society. They're just a drain on our resources. And, and I feel bad for them because if any of you have ever gone through a period where maybe you couldn't find a job, I don't know about you, but it doesn't feel right. You know, you're, you're, you're not complete unless you've got that feeling that, hey, I can, I can stand on my own two feet. Yes, I can, I can get a job. It may not be the best job and it may be too low paying for now, but I'm paying my bills. I'm meeting my obligations. There's a moral satisfaction and fulfillment in that. And we take it away. We deprive these people of it by making them long-term clients of the welfare state. What's the fairness? What's the ethical case for our, our tax system? You know, we have people right now saying, oh, you got to tax the rich more. Or you got to tax the, 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 the uh, people who make more money more. Well, okay. But look at the top 20% of Americans in terms of annual income, you find that on average, they have 2.0 workers in that household, more than one job. In the bottom 20% of our income, the typical household has 0 0.4 workers per household. In other words, probably one person working a part-time job. It's obvious why that family is a lot poorer than the family with two people working. But where's the justice in penalizing the family that has two people working to give it to one where only 0.4% or 0.4, four tenths of a person statistically is, is, is working. That's why every time the Republicans come up with the proposal for welfare, they, they call it workfare. They say, we, we at least want people to, to work for what they're receiving. I think most of us can agree that's not a, an evil position, but it gets demagogued by the other side. Okay, the economics of egalitarianism. Again, we just talked about paying some people not to work, 
um, that means less wealth is being produced. You got people sitting on the sidelines, there's less wealth being produced. You know, wealth is not self-generating. Somebody's got to do the work to produce it. Fewer workers, less wealth for society. That's not good. And the idea that we got to go after the rich and oh, they, you know, Bill Gates has too much money, more than he can possibly spend, which is perfectly true. But it's capital. And the left doesn't like to admit this. Karl Marx rejected it, but, it, but it's true. Capital helps the poor more than it helps the rich. Why? The rich already have the mansion, the fancy car, the, the, the fur coats, what, what, you know, whatever creature pleasures they want, they, creature comforts they want, they've got them. The leftover stuff is capital. They don't, they don't need to spend that to have a higher standard of living. So the capital is invested where it provides jobs so that somebody who isn't rich and needs a job can go to work and start drawing a paycheck and taking care of himself and his family. That's socially beneficial. You know, the problem with our socialists and there's a lot of them in Washington today, and some of them are starting to admit that they're socialists. They have this grandiose plan or set of plans, you know, the, the Green New Deal and uh, industrial policy. You know, we're going we're gonna to support the manufacture of electric vehicles. We're going to support uh, the chip into the, the computer chip industry, on and on and on. We're going to support all these people. Well, all right. But that central planning never works. If, if central planning worked, we'd all be emulating the Soviet Union today. It doesn't work. It's top down. It reminds me of another Bible story. That's the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11. You know, what you had there was you had people trying to use human wisdom to build this tower to, well, to, to heaven, to the perfect life. And they couldn't do it. And in the process of doing it, this is what's interesting. I heard a Jewish rabbi explain this once. The bricks were uniform. You know, they're, they're fungible. They're interchangeable. But when you try to build a society from the top down and human beings are your bricks, human beings aren't identical. Human beings aren't fungible and, and freely interchangeable. We each have our own unique set of talents. And we need the freedom to find out how best to use those talents both for society's benefit and for our own. Central planning interferes with the freedom of the majority of the population to find their right spot. And that's why socialism always collapses because it's fundamentally irrational to believe that a few people have the answers, have the master plan that's gonna work for everybody. And finally, there's political, the political consequence. Well, what happens when you have this egalitarian agenda where the emphasis is on government redistributing wealth, the government grows. The government constantly becomes more powerful because it decides whose rights are safe and whose rights are going to be negated, whose rights are going to be chucked overboard because we want the money spent over here and you'd rather do something else with it that's just too darn bad because we've got the power and you don't and we're taking it from you to give it over here. Egalitarianism feeds big government. And there are historical examples of that. And we can go back farther than the Soviet Union. You can go back to the Roman Empire where the demagogic senators, who you know, they would go to the voters and say, hey, I give you free stuff, bread and circuses. Of course, then they had to tax the productive sector, as the taxes got heavier and heavier, more and more people that were on farms, they just left the Roman provinces and said, we're out of here. We're not going to just do this backbreaking labor and have the government take all of it to give it to those people in the, in the forum enjoying the circuses. The Roman Empire collapsed because of this redistributive function of government. By the way, little change of pace here. I don't know if any of you like to read historical novels. 
there was a novelist uh, popular in like 50s, 60s, 70s, Taylor Caldwell. Her full name was Janet Taylor Caldwell, a female author, brilliant, brilliant thinker. Um, wrote a book about the Apostle Paul, Great Lion of God. Wrote another novel about Luke, St. Luke, uh, Dear and Glorious Physician. But my favorite Taylor, I've probably read five or six of her novels, good stuff. But if you really want to get a look at parallels between ancient Rome and today, both economically and in terms of what was happening in, in the faith realm, Taylor Caldwell's book, A Pillar of Iron, I highly recommend it. Uh, its lead character is the Roman orator Cicero. Fantastic historical novel, very informative for today. But there you have it with the egalitarians. It's, it, you know, they're really the ultimate hypocrites because they keep preaching I, equality, equality, equality. But the only way they can somehow bring this vision of theirs about is to have tons more power than everybody else. I mean, the, the leaders of the egalitarians, you're going to have the most unequal distribution of power imaginable. Egalitarian, it, it, it's like a throwback to feudalism where you had an elite making the, all the key economic decisions. Mercantilism, you had an elite making economic decisions. Then you had capitalism where the economic decisions were diffused over a free population and we had great prosperity. Then you had a reaction to capitalism called socialism, which again is elitist. You know, they, they talk about brotherhood, they talk about charity, they talk about equality. There's no equality in a socialist society. You have a powerful elite. And then the masses of people are struggling to get by down there. So the egalitarian message is, is it, it, it's a deceptive lie. It's, it's pretty vicious stuff. And um, I've got a couple other things, but I think in the interest of time and having kept you late, let me just close by reading some wisdom from an earlier American, one of our presidents, Andrew Jackson. Quote, distinctions in society will always exist under every just government, under just, fair governments, under just government. Equality of talents, of education, or of wealth cannot be produced by human institutions. In the full enjoyment of the gifts of heaven and the fruits of superior industry, economy, and virtue, every man is equally entitled to protection by law. But when the laws undertake to add to these natural and just advantages, artificial distinctions, to grant titles, gratuities, and exclusive privileges, or subsidies, or cronyism, as we call it today, to make the rich richer and the potent more powerful, the humble members of society, the farmers, mechanics, and laborers who have neither the time nor the means of securing like favors to themselves have a right to complain of the injustice of their government. Natural differences, natural inequality is inherently just. The injustice arises when we try to artificially squeeze those natural inequalities out of our society. Now, we need to accept natural inequality if we're going to be free and prosperous. Egalitarianism is the enemy of that. Egalitarianism, it's wicked, oppressive, unjust. It's anti-wealth, therefore anti-progress, therefore anti-life. There's no place in our economy. That's the end. Um, I'd be glad to take any questions that anybody has. So for um, Q&A, we would like to ask everybody if they can use the reactions where it says raise hand so we at least can get to the most questions as possible. I see under chat here, Hunter, it's got two. Should, should I open up chat on my screen and see what it says? Absolutely. 
Okay. You guys can tell I'm a tech whiz, can't you? <laughs> okay. Uh, but somebody said something very nice. Thank you, Laura. Yeah. Um, still open for questions. So I actually do have a question. Um, so one of the things I often hear today about the egalitarian argument is like, okay, well, sure, it may not be as appealing, but what about today's um, arguments about libertarian paternalism, trying to say, well, we give people options and therefore maybe a way to exercise equality within, say, a free market society, but obviously that doesn't seem to be the case with libertarian paternalism. So what? how can especially young economists address this particular issue? You know, I'm not familiar with this libertarian paternalism. That sounds almost like, like an oxymoron in a way, because I think of libertarianism as just hands off, just let things go. Um, economically, I would speak in terms of um, equality of opportunity. You know, the egalitarians want to guarantee equality of results. The freedom-loving individual just says, look, we don't owe anybody a fortune, but we do owe them the right to be free to pursue a fortune. And if they have the skill and the drive and the persistence to successfully serve others in the free marketplace and prosper and become rich as a result of that, that's what it's all about. So equality of opportunity, yeah. You know, I started off by saying, in what sense do we mean all men are created equal? Well, they should have equal opportunities. But because of our inherent differences, we're not going to have equal results. And societies really hurt themselves, cripple themselves by trying to somehow hammer things in a way to guarantee equal outcomes. Uh, they think they're helping and they're not. That's, that, that kind of interference is totally counterproductive. Does anybody else have any questions? I see one that just popped up on the screen here. How do we get others to see capitalism as a good? That's a profound question. I, I think along those lines, fairly often, it's like, I mean, to me, it's just so crystal clear. And yet, when I came out of college, I was a socialist. I've been brainwashed for four years. I didn't have the good fortune of attending Grove City College. It's an uphill battle, largely because I think of our educational system, but it's not just the schools. It's, it's the mass media. It's woke corporations these days. Um, I think it's a lack of religious faith because I will say that in my early 20s, when I broke the spell of socialism and saw the light, it, it accompanied my religious rebirth. What the young people are taught in most colleges is that they are an elite. They're the enlightened ones. They know the way things are supposed to be. Their professors share with them a vision of a better world, a kinder world, a more just world. And all you have to do is change this from here to here and here to here. In fact, I, I left out near the end of the lecture. I'll, I'll bring it in here because it applies. Adam Smith referred to that approach. He, he said the man of system, the one that wants to plan from the top down, views his fellow men like chess men on a board as just inert things to be manipulated by his mind. Writing 90 years later, the, the brilliant and lucid French economics writer, Frederick Bastiat, he used the word socialist. That was already in common usage then in France. He said the socialists treat the average man like a pruner treats his hedge. Again, the idea that, you know, the person's not going to change. He's just, he's just there passively. And it's up to 
the socialist with his grand vision for better society to just come out there with the shears and clip, 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 and come up with this beautiful design made out of the hedges. Never thinking that these hedges, these human beings, wanted to do something other than what the socialist planner wanted them to do. So we, we need to, I think, also have a religious revival where we regain this sense that the great intelligence of the universe is not the most educated human beings, but we have a divine father that we're all accountable to and who knows what's best for us. And let's read his word in the Bible and learn what's best for us. And let's be kind and loving to each other. I mean, that's part of the divine law. You know, the, the, the marketplace to me is as close as you can come economically to the golden rule. Because the way you prosper in a free market is to do something for others. I don't think this is rocket science. So I think it, these simple truths can be shared with our nieces and nephews or grandchildren or whoever, give them a little tutoring outside the classroom, you know, speak the truth. Jesus said, John 8, 32, ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free, but it sure helps if somebody speaks the truth. So if you understand this stuff, share it. I mean, I wish one of us could get a podium where the whole world would listen to us. I don't think it's going to happen, but one by one, let's, let's start where we are. Let's start with our neighbor. Let's start with a buddy that we have coffee with once a week, you know, and, and see, not, not, not preach at them, but just gently kind of introduce some of these ideas and sort of naturally lead into just help them to see just the common sense of what free people can do. And good golly, there's no shortage of examples out there about how government's messing, messing things up. So, um, you know, we've, we've, we've got a lot of wisdom we can share with, with people, a lot of truth we can share with people. And um, so if we understand what makes capitalism good and more just than the alternative, let's, let's spread the message. Um, are there any further questions that anybody would like to ask? I would just like to say one more time, thank you folks for being here. Thank you for your support of Grove City College. I'm just so sorry for the technical difficulties. I, I did not want to waste your time. And Hunter and I are going to do our best next month to be ready to go at the stipulated starting hour. So thanks so much for your patience and forgiveness and God bless you.